Okay. All righty. So what we're going to do here um, is I'm going to kind of come out and try to speak very specifically to what I've been moving around. And that's this connection between the Bible and the Enneagram um, that, uh, that I've found. And um, let me start by saying um, what I think the Enneagram is insofar as you're talking about, you know, the circle with nine lines and, and the points. Um, it's a mnemonic device. It's a memory aid. Okay. And it's put together so you can remember something. And of course, that opens the question, what is it that we're supposed to be calling to mind or able to remember using this device um, that the device itself goes back um, to the Middle Ages, this guy Raymond Lowell, and you can read about that in, in there. I won't tell you about it now. Um, and essentially what it is, it's um, as, as it functions for the personality types, it's a mnemonic device or a memory aid for the soul. Um, for understanding and kind of keeping in mind different patterns of, of soul, okay? Now, why do I say that? Um, it's because I think that you have this biblical account in the background, and you'll remember that where we get these three impulses, which I'll describe in a minute how when they get twisted in, very, in a very particular way, we end up with these nine types, okay? Um, but where these come from, they first emerge in Genesis 2, right? Genesis 1 gives us the dominion as kind of the essence of, of personhood. Um, but it's when we move to Genesis 2 and we get that bottom-up approach, and it's at that point that the emphasis becomes um, living soul. Okay, that it's, it's very specifically dealing with us as, as, soul, that, as souls that we have these three kind of needs impulses to produce, um, to protect, and to communicate or relate. Um, and you just, you'll remember that when we talk about soul in distinction from heart or spirit, okay, what we're talking about is this kind of layer of us that largely runs automatically, okay? And it's, it's designed to give life to a body, okay? It, it sustains our body. Um, but what it does is it, it kind of holds the, um, the programs that take over and go automatically when we're otherwise too tired to show up and make a decision, okay? Um, showing up and making the decision when we're really there, that, that's, that's spirit activity that, or heart activity, which are, are um, I think, interchangeable in Scripture. Okay? Um, but soul is this kind of deeper um, layer that is kind of running the show when I just can't. Okay? It's what I default to. And I, what I see happening here in Scripture is that, that those default patterns get kind of twisted and kinked in a really particular way, okay? And so um, the, it, you'll notice we, we put this together and the creation direction of this, so to speak, the way they're introduced is going counterclockwise, okay? We're put in the garden to produce and protect and call, relate, okay? But we, we also notice that when sin enters in, they're changed, but they're changed in a clockwise pattern. It gets twisted in a certain way, okay? That the first thing that we experience is, is shame and a need to cover up because of that. Um, and what's happening there is the beginning of this um, clockwise I think the best word for it is smearing, <laughs> okay? Because what happens is where, what we end up with in these, um, I don't know if we've used the word triads yet much here, but um, one of the ways that each of these segments is talked about, the, um, uh, well, the other, 
the intelligence centers, right, is um, as triads because there's three within each of them, right? And so 891 is a triad, two, three, four, triad, so forth, right? Um, now, what you find is that there's this kind of overlaying of two impulses, of two tasks, created tasks, where one is read or kind of interpreted as being the other. And that's the fundamental confusion that becomes the problem for, for these, these groupings, for these triads, okay? Let me try to um, make that specific, okay? So what's going on here in, um, in uh, two, three, four is something that you could say like this. Um, I want relation. I want, what I really want is that personal connection and, and, and knowing that, that we're, re, we're, we're communicating, we're, we're, um, um, we're in each other's lives. But in order to do that, I have to produce something. And so it's something like behind, behind these three as the fundamental problem is something like um, relation, relationship is work or a production, okay? I'm sorry, it's got to go sideways, but... <laughs> um, and, and so kind of at the heart of these three is this sense there's no free lunch. Um, what I, I really want to connect, but if I'm going to connect, then I have to produce something that makes me connectable. Okay. And now what we'll come back around and, um, well, actually I'll just do it as I go. Part of what you'll see is that for each of the triads, there's a kind of what I would call a bow tie, um, or Mobius strip <laughs> pattern, where you have in these three, on one side, um, the, the first of each of these going this direction, there's a, this real directness to resolving that problem, okay? It's like the most direct, efficient way to fix that um, as it's formulated, okay? And so you'll, you're gonna see that in two, five, and eight. Um, and so the, I, I think of this as, as the want to, okay, um, the want to um, resolution to the problem. On the other side, you're going to get um, this sense of what I need to do is find a way to kind of transcend, find some ideal that gets me out of, allows me to go above, above this problem. And so you get the ought to response. And in between, what you get in each of the primary, the, the center types, is a kind of resigned response. It's just like, this is just how it is. There's nothing you can do about it. You're just going to, you know, just deal with it, work with it, right? And so, um, to whatever the central problem is, okay? And so, with two, you have this I want connection, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to find what you need and I'm going to, I'm going to produce it, so then you'll connect. Okay? Three is resigned to um, all communication, all relationship is a production. And so they're just like, I'm going to achieve, I'm going to produce so that people will, will relate. You know, if, and the idea is I'm going to work, 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 work. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do all that. And then kind of imagine that's going to bring people to, to come to me. Okay. Um, all, all of these are failing strategies. By the way, as you, we go throughout, there's not a single strategy anywhere that really works completely. Okay. There's always little bits that keep us going. But, um, um, but all of these come from this twist. Right. And then four is the kind of idealized version. It's like, I shouldn't have to be like anybody else. 
I shouldn't have to, to do something for you to relate. So I'm going to be myself. Right. And, you know, and I'll pout if you're not connecting to me like that. <laughs> um, and, but then kind of being myself becomes its own production. It kind of becomes an act in a way um, with this one. Okay. The second um, layer of this twist here um, is that we have this kind of threat negotiation aspect to us and it gets overlaid by relationship or communication. And so behind um, uh, seven, six, and five is this sense that um, relation, communication, right? is threat negotiation. And so you, you have the same kind of want to, resign to, ought to pattern, um, like three different strategies in dealing with this core problem of bringing relationship into, like viewing it through threat. Okay. And so what five does, it's the direct version and it's relations or threat. I'm getting out. <laughs> um, see if you can find me. I'll be out preparing for when I have to relate. Okay. And, and because relating, you prepare for it like you're like Rocky Balboa. Okay. Getting ready for, for the battle because that's, that's kind of this kink, like, you know, Intimacy, like real human connection, um, that, that's scary. That, that's threatening. And so I'm, I'm pulled out, not forever, but to get ready for the big fight, okay? Or the big relation, right? Which is that it is, takes, that, takes that spot, right? And that's where that search for competency and all that comes from, right? Six is just resigned to it. It's like, yeah, there's like all around, it's threatening, and institutions, they're going to hurt you, you know, they're going to crush you, they're just using you, you know, and people, well, there's, there's two sides to them and they're going to turn on you, right? And so you're just, you know, stay hyper vigilant, but then maybe I'm going to try to get on the good side of that institution. I know it's going to run over me eventually, but maybe I can find a way to use it. So I'm in the, maybe I can be in it when it runs over somebody else instead of being under the bus, you know? Um, and so there's ways of, of dealing with that there. That's just kind of resigned to this notion that relationship is threat. Okay. Now five or seven, um, there, in terms of this problem, they're the idealists, okay? Relations shouldn't be a threat. And usually what's felt to be threatening for seven is a sense that you get stuck. It closes your option. You know, it's like um, in those relations, people are too sticky and you can't get on to something else, <laughs> right? And so, um, and so what they do is they just kind of keep moving, you know, pop, you know, but and they keep their focus going uh, a thousand and one directions revved up. And what they're doing is they're, they're staying away from that underlying sense of threat. Okay. Um, and then we get this final smear <laughs> go in this direction up to eight, nine, one. And what happens is that threat negotiation gets overlaid or smeared into this um, production of value to work, okay? And what you end up with, the metaphor that's the, the, the primary um, problem here is that, um, well, let's see. Uh, threats are work or work is threat negotiation, right? Production is um, threat negotiation. Uh, there we go. Um, okay. And so what's happening here is that this part of, the, of my 
of my soul, of this part that I, you know, I'm not really choosing it. It's just, it's running no matter what, that, that feels a need to, to, to create, to make value, to, to bring things into the world, um, to kind of conceive a plan and carry it out. That gets filtered over with this sense of there being threat involved in it. And, and the idea is that I, I think underneath this is like, well, but whose agenda? Which project? They're always competing. Like you try to get anything done and there's somebody else that wants to do something different, right? And so it, it causes conflict. And what you do then is you have the, the want to, resign to, ought to um, kind of pattern again. Um, eight is, is the direct want to. It says, um, there's always competing agendas. One's gonna win, one's gonna lose, mine's winning. Okay? And, you know, just buckle up because my, my project is gonna run over your project. Okay? Um, and, and so that's, you know, that, that's kind of the, the core push there. Nine is resigned to the fact that all work is complicated by other people's agendas that tend to run them, run over each other. And it's kind of, it tends to say, right? Like there's no way out. And so it becomes adept at kind of letting go of its own project and trying to blend in with others because um, underneath is this kind of despair that one's project could ever be successful. Right? There's a sense that if I really go after it, I'm just set, getting set up for somebody else's project to run over mine. So it's better to, you know, to stop now. <laughs> right? Um, these produce a lot of other aspects, but I'm just talking about, as it were, the kind of the core um, piece in each of these. Um, and then one is the, the ought to, the transcendent. Um, kind of idealized um, way out of this problem that work is threat negotiation. And the way it does that is it says, <clears throat> well, there's all kinds of different agendas. There are all sorts of different things people want done, but there must be one that ought to be the one that happens, <laughs> right? There's a right one and there's lots of wrong ones. And I'll just align myself with the right one, right? And that ought to that ought to get me out of this problem of work is threat negotiation, okay? So this particular pattern is what, when that popped out from this biblical anthropology that I had already done before I ever came to the Enneagram, that's when I thought, oh, there's something to this that is deeply compatible, right? Um, and why I started kind of giving more, more credence to it. Okay, let me pause there for a second. Did that make any sense at all? Yeah, okay. I think most of us are familiar, some of us are more familiar than others, but we've now at least had an introduction to each of these types. And so we can have kind of a sense of, of how that names something central to each of them. Um, okay, and um, let me just also point point out as you go around then, so this relation is production. Think of, of shame and fig leaves. That's where it shows up, right? And in order to not be seen for what I am, well, kind of at the heart of this is to be loved for who I really am, I have to be something I'm really not, <laughs> right? Um, and so that's where the fig leaf thing comes in, right? This sense of um, I look at you, I worry about me, so I, I come up with some way of producing a covering. And that's what two, three, four are all different varieties of, right? And then the Lord God comes to talk. There's this offer of relationship. And Adam and Eve, it, they're fearful. They, they take that invitation to relate as a threat, and they hide, Okay. Um, and so that's kind of what's going on here at the center. We, we have three different strategies for hiding from that threat of real connection. Okay. Um, and then he says, uh, where are you? 
did you eat? Well, what, what did you do? And they're incapable of giving a straight answer to any of it. Instead, what they do is they say, well, that one did and this, they start pointing to every other actor as, and kind of deflecting responsibility from themselves, right? Um, and so this evasion of kind of owning one's own responsibility for one's own work, one's own production in the world, right? Um, because that scene is somehow threatening, right? That's at the core of all three of these, okay? Okay, so um, how long have I been going? Started about 40 after, something like that? 45, 50, okay. Um, so, so this is why I say that what you have in the Enneagram is a memory aid of the soul, okay? Because it's telling us, um, as it were, it, it's charting for our, for our memory so we can pull out what are these, these basic twists, these overlays in this created, um, uh, these created soul functions, okay? And that's why none of these types, um, none of them are, are good at bottom, okay? <laughs> they, they all come out because we're twisted in certain ways. Um, that doesn't mean that we, that we can get out of that, but they, um, this is a general principle. We look at things like this and we say, wait, I mean, if that's sin, then we got to get out. We want, why didn't God prevent it, right? And we tend to want God to deal with evil by prevention or by deleting it once it's there. We'll just, we'll just take all those away and we'll go back to just these three, right? But that's, what God does, he doesn't tend to work by prevention, but by redemption, okay? And so this kind of, of smear has taken place and it's, it's down in those levels of us that, that don't talk much, that don't ask our permission before they do something, right? They're, they're, they're in the automatic, um, you know, nervous system kind of stuff. Um, but what God does is he comes to us in those places and as it were addressing the basic thing underneath each of these, he calls us to redemption, okay? Now, I want to say a word, and now we, I, I popped out to do actual Enneagram <laughs> or, you know, something like that. I, I think of this as an x-ray of it. It's kind of like showing the bones behind it. You'll notice there's not a lot of detail there. Um, x-rays don't give you all the detail in your body. It just gives a structure in the background. Um, and I think that's what the Bible does. It actually x-rays what's going on in the soul that you get fleshed out in this Enneagram um, tradition, okay? Now, um, I wanna come back to the Bible to say something about how this can be then helpful um, for us as we uh, walk with the Lord, okay? And so I'm gonna ask you to, to turn to, to Luke chapter nine verses 23 through 27. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> the Lord now, he addresses those that would come after him and he begins to talk about what it means to say no to oneself and he connects that up actually very, very specifically with saying that the self that we're saying no to is our soul. Okay. Um, and so he, he begins to, to address ways in which um, to, to grow, to follow Jesus. Um, we, we have to be prepared to, um, to actively kind of resist and work on changing certain things that are there in this underlying level, okay? So um, let, let's start by just reading this. And so somebody would read it nice and loud. Um, Luke chapter nine, verses 23 through 27. 
And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Okay, thank you. Um, first thing to point out here, so this is, this is one of those hard passages, right? Take up your cross, not once, not twice, do it daily, and follow me. Um, and he, then Jesus kind of cashes that out. He explains that more specifically as telling oneself no. Okay? That's what denying oneself. It's, it's saying no to oneself. Okay? And then what he does um, is he begins to focus in on these particular um, uh, primary impulses that we were created for. And he starts with the protection one and how that one gets kind of um, twisted, right? Um, he, he says, uh, if you're, whoever wishes to preserve, and it always gets translated life, but it's actually the word soul. Anyone who wants to preserve his soul uh, must lose it, okay? He who, who loses or even destroys, it has, right, one's, his soul, for my sake, um, um, is the one um, who will preserve it or save it, okay? So what he's doing is he's interacting with this level of us that is geared towards protecting, standing up, intervening, seeing to it that whatever's good stays that way, okay? And um, essentially what he's addressing is this tendency um, at, at each of these levels, what he's going to talk about is a kind of inward curvature, if I could put it that way. That there's this tendency to take my, my, my impulse to protect and turn it in primarily to self-preservation. Okay? And it, it turns out, and this is just Jesus' amazing wisdom, um, that he sees this and he says it out loud, that um, when I... When I focus that part of me on just taking care of me rather than protecting God's world, um, paradoxically, it doesn't save me, it destroys me. Okay? When that curves in on myself, it's like what the soul does when it gets fixated on self-preservation. It starts building this wall around itself that gets thicker and thicker and thicker. But once that wall is built, it eats itself. It, it can't, because that protection impulse has to go somewhere. And so, in other words, the threat that, that needs to be negotiated and actually dealt with to take care of others in God's world, like to really do that, once I build that wall around me, all of that stuff inside that God gave me to be able to detect threat and, go, and, and interact and, and overcome it, it turns in on myself and, I, and, and it starts damaging me. Um, in trying to preserve my soul, I lose it. Okay? Um, why? Okay? Why? It's because the soul was not just, it wasn't designed by God just to take care of, of this body. You know, see to it that the heart keeps ticking and my breath keeps going. Um, the, my soul was given to me. Yes, it's to do that also. But more than that, before that, it, it's given to me so I can protect the goodness of God's world and others within it. Um, the soul is created for adventure. And so it's only, and this is why it's only when one is sold out for Jesus... Right? When one kind of lets go of self-preservation to just kind of be all in for Jesus and the gospel, that suddenly the soul comes to life again. 
He who loses his soul for my sake, right? he finds it. He finds life. It's preserved. Why? Because you were created for adventure. This part of you is your inner fighter. And God designed that to be working out there in his world. And if you turn that in to just taking care of yourself, you end up killing yourself with it. I mean, it's a deep truth. Okay. Um, but you turn it outward, if it's there for Christ, for your neighbor, to, to actually engage in God's world, then the, the risk-taking, um, the, 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 the adventure, um, the quest that you were made for, you're living out. And, and this impulse, because you've said no to yourself at the level of trying to of turning it into just taking care of yourself, um, it begins to live. That, that's the paradox. Okay? And Jesus moves on. Um, he, he moves to this um, production impulse, and he says, um, essentially, that when that gets turned inward, what it looks like is this obsession with getting enough um, making sure that I, that I have extra, that I, that I have ga- some gain, okay? And um, what that looks like, you have this kind of common storyline. Um, and you hear it, you know, on the lips of people who are, you know, 50, 60, fairly often, 40, 50, 60. It's something like this. Um, you know, when I was young, I had this goal, and I went after it. I had to get all the things, you know, I, I, I wanted to, um, you know, be respected. And so, you know, I competed in sports. I got the degrees, you know, I got the good job. Um, I rose to the top. I, I, you know, met all the achievements one after another, after another, I got the house, I got the toys, (laughs) you know, um, made the family, all of this. And I, I, I produced everything that was supposed to be what mattered. And I've achieved it all, and now I don't even know who I am. It's something empty, and I don't understand it anymore. Right? And so what Jesus, as he describes this, it's what does a man gain? What does he profit if he acquires the whole world but loses himself somewhere in the process? Okay? And the flip side of this is then that by taking up one's cross, by saying no to um, this form of twisting the work impulse, (laughs) right? Um, It can be made right and um, come back in a way that by producing um, for the kingdom, by by saying no to myself in this particular way, um, there can be a new form of life. Now, The last one, this relation impulse, um, he begins to talk about who do I blush in front of, okay? And you see what happens when the relation impulse, that communication impulse gets turned inward is I experience shame, embarrassment, you know? Um, And so what Jesus, and it's something like, you know, I. I, I want to know you, but I don't want to be known by you, <laughs> or I'm afraid, you know. Um, and so um, um, this gets, gets twisted up in some ways. Anyhow, what Jesus does here is he addresses um, a misunderstanding of the limits of our social world, the horizon of our social world, right? um, that actually produces this sense of embarrassment in front of people. Okay, um, and the mis the misunderstanding of the limits of our social world is that we live primarily just in front of human beings. Okay, and what happens is we actually, um, when we do this, we kind of bring this human audience into our soul, <laughs> and we live as if there's always somebody watching and critiquing. 
Okay? And if we do that, then we may find ourselves blushing in front of somebody um, when we say that we're following Jesus. Okay? Um, because what will they think? Okay? And so what he does is he kind of redraws the limits of our social world for us. Um, he says um, that the, the real limits of our social world are not just human. They include the Father and the angels and those who will not taste death. Um, this passage, um, another way you can translate this is, um, I, I say to you um, that there are some of those standing here um, who shall not taste death right, or until the kingdom of God comes. This isn't saying that they're going to taste, that they'll die when the kingdom comes. There's this category in Jewish thought of those who will not taste death. And I'll give you a name and you'll know what I'm talking about. Enoch, Elijah. Those are in this category of those who will not taste death. And he's telling them um, there's some of those ones that are in the room too. Okay? And you'll just notice you get to the next path. They're going to go up on this Mount of Transfiguration. And who do they meet there? Some of those who don't taste death. Okay? And kind of the point that Jesus is saying, if, if you're worried about how people are looking at you, if you're feeling, um, you know, sheepish, shy about following me, what you need to know is that you live with a lot more people watching than just human beings. And there's always more people in the room than you can see. And the, those that you can't see but are in the room they last. <laughs> They're immortal. They never taste death. Okay? And so if you're beginning to feel, I don't know, is it worth standing out? Remember, before the Father and the holy angels and folks like Enoch and Elijah, um, maybe, maybe we should care more about what they're thinking than what the guy on the street is going to look sideways at. Okay? Um, and so, um, with this, he kind of specifies how to take up our cross and have that right what has been twisted within our soul in terms of each of these specific impulses. Okay. So let me just end by saying this. So what, what special help is there from this kind of um, much more developed, fleshed out body on top of the skeleton that we get with the whole Enneagram. And I think the answer is this. It allows me to understand more clearly what I, in the particularity of the, the twist in my soul, which happens to be over here, right? Um, what does it mean for me to say no to myself to follow Jesus? Because what I'm going to have to say no to is going to be a little different than what somebody else is going to have to say no to. I, I, we all have to resist something twisted and wrong in our own soul. We, ha we have to do that. We have to, um, we have to say no to ourselves in order to go through this process. But what particularly in each soul is kind of the sticking point, the difficulty, that, that's different because souls have different strategies kind of built into them. And so I think one of the things that the Enneagram does is it helps me know how specifically I need to say no to my soul so I can follow Jesus. That's one of the things it's really good for, okay? All right, so I'm gonna stop with that. Um, questions or comments?